Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Licia Fiolmata. I'm the chairperson of the Latin American and Puerto Rican Studies Department. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our event, Chronicling the Puerto Rican Diaspora, a tribute to Professor Javier Totti. Uh, we're glad to see you here. First, uh, thanks to the people who made this possible, our sponsors. This is a, a joint event between Lehman College and the Center for Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College. And it is my understanding that they're live streaming our event. Thank you very much for the setup. Uh, we are also very grateful to the Office of the uh, Provost. A special shout out to Julissa in the Office of the Provost and also the Vice President for Student Affairs. Thank you to Jose Magdaleno for his generous support and to the Pro Interim Provost Joseph Rackman. Thanks also to all our colleagues, our students for being here, the Dean of the School of Arts and Humanities, Timothy Alburn. Thank you for being here. And uh, it is a great, great uh, pleasure to have particularly Lauren Thomas, Professor Thomas, as our keynote speaker, and the folks who are participating in our panel discussion following this uh, keynote by Professor Thomas. You're all cordially invited to stay for the panel discussion with Javier Totti, Arlene Torres, and Edgardo Melendez. After that, we will proceed to our festivities just outside the hall, you are all invited to our reception where we can continue our conversations. I would also be remiss if I didn't take a moment to thank Professor David Badillo of our own Latin American and Puerto Rican Studies Department for organizing the event, uh, taking care of all the details in such a professional and diligent way. Thank you, David, very much. Uh, I also have to say there's a couple of events coming up that I want to tell you about before we begin. One is our conference, Salu, Beyond Deficits and Paradoxes in Mexican Immigration and Health. This is also the launch of our newly created CUNY Mexican Studies Institute. There are flyers available. It will be May 11th from 8.45 to 6 p.m. There is also a video conference on teaching the Puerto Rican diaspora, is that the right title? Yes. Uh, May 2nd at 10, 10 in, Carmen 225. in Carmen 225. It's also a joint event with the Center for Puerto Rican Studies. We are delighted to honor our dear colleague, Javier Toti, in his 10th year as editor of the Centro Journal. Our department encourages and supports synergy between teaching and scholarship. And I speak for all of us in saying that Javier is the person we all look up to as our leader and inspiration. He is the heart and soul of our department. His love and dedication to Lehman College is an example to students, colleagues, and all the people who work here. Personally, I am grateful to Javier for always supporting me, for his mentorship, generosity, helpful advice, and last but not least, scholarly insights and deep knowledge of our field of Puerto Rican and Latino studies. He is a true listener, and it's not often that you find true listeners. He is always even keeled, has a golden sense of humor, and no matter the task, from exciting to thankless, working with Javier is always rewarding and often fun. As a Puerto Rican woman and scholar of Puerto Rican studies, I admire Javier's vision in reconceptualizing the Centro Journal for our times. While cognizant of the historical importance of Puerto Rican studies and a great defender of this field and its continued relevance, he has brought the journal into cutting edge diaspora studies, moving beyond insular ethnic studies frameworks and polarizing debates into studies of alterities and post-nationalism, among other things. He has professionalized the journal by rehauling the peer review process, issuing innovative call for papers covering music, race, queer studies, while continuing the Centro's strong record of empirical research. Centro is a truly interdisciplinary journal that addresses the multifaceted nature of the field, supports the work of younger scholars, and disseminates new research. Javier enjoys a deserved national and international profile, having brought Centro to various sites, including Mexico and Spain, and also 
inserting our journal into global virtual databases and a global community of scholars. He commands respect in our intellectual community and is one of Lima's greatest assets. We wish Javier continued success in the journal and thank him wholeheartedly for his presence, wisdom, bafflingly good nature, and willingness to share his many talents. And now I leave you with Alberto Hernandez, who is the director of the Library of the Center for Puerto Rican Studies and its archives. Buenas tardes. On behalf of Edwin Melendez, director of the Centro, and all the Centro staff, it is my pleasure to also give you a welcome for this event commemorating uh, Professor Javier Totti's 10th anniversary as managing editor of the Centro Journal. The Centro Journal has become the leading journal in the field of Puerto Rican studies and is among the leading journals in Latino and ethnic studies. The journal is indexed by 20 different services and has won over 10 academic design and community services awards. Centro Journal has been published twice a year uninterrupted since 1987 for a total of 43 issues. Last year alone, more than 100,000 copies of articles from Centro Journal were downloaded from academic distribution from services such as EBSCO and Ready Lake, the Revista de Científicas de Latino America. Such great accomplishments are in no small measure due to the extraordinary dedication and leadership of Professor Totti. He reads and recommends for blind review four to six manuscripts for each paper that is published in the journal. He has instituted management systems to ensure the highest standards and continuous publication of the journal. The journal is also evolving into new formats that allow us to take advantage of new printing technologies and these technologies will adapt the journal content to new media formats and reduce production costs significantly. Dedication and leadership produces innovation. For most of you in the audience, these accolades for Professor Totti are not new. What few know about is the entrepreneurial vision and leadership that Professor Totti brings to Centro as an organization. Under his leadership, Centro has launched Voices, an electronic magazine, and Centro Press an academic publisher that is about to become a reality in a few weeks. These publications have the potential for greatly enhancing the field of Puerto Rican studies. The success of the Centro General over the last decade or any of the new publishing ventures will be impossible in the absence of, of an academic entrepreneur. Professor Totti possesses the breadth and knowledge and the gentle experience of a seasoned administrator. Today we celebrate his many contributions to the field and offer a well-deserved recognition for making a difference in our community. I hope you, all, you will join with us for the festivity of this special occasion. Muchas gracias. Well, yes, Javier is a great colleague and a music lover to boot. And he's also a little modest, so I think uh, you're ready for us to move along in the program. Yes. For, okay. yes. And um, we have a keynote speech here, a, a talk by uh, Professor Lauren Thomas uh, from Rutgers uh, down in Camden. And she's a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, she did a book which received the Saludos Award from uh, the Organization of American Historians, or one of their committees. Uh, that was for her book entitled Puerto Rican Citizen History and Political Identity in 20th Century New York City. And her talk today is going to be an elaboration on some of the themes, but there's going to be a lot of original material here. So we're looking forward to, um, to Lauren's presentation. And then uh, stick around for the panel, because uh, our colleague um, uh, Andres uh, uh, Torres is putting together a very interesting panel, which is going to feed off a lot of the ideas here. So by the time you leave, we hope everyone's going to be really steeped in uh, the Puerto Rican diaspora. So uh, we're very grateful, and please welcome uh, Lauren Thomas. This was a, a political fight because it exposed really a minefield of both institutional and intellectual power politics, um, and disarmed that minefield with disrupting narratives that challenged conventional narratives of who matters and who doesn't in history. So Puerto Ricans began the 1960s as a quote, people without history, as a famous anthropologist has said about other groups. Uh, but within that decade, thousands of activists and, and intellectuals had changed that 
dramatically. Um, so I want to explore the, the political work of those who demanded space for Puerto Rican history within the academy um, and the legacy of that at activism to which Javier would become connected most directly when he joined the Centro three, uh, three decades after its founding. But of course, I've heard um, stories of him as an activist at the same time in the early 70s, right? Didn't you tell me a story about uh, uh, storming uh, Escambron, La Playa Escambron? Yes. <laughs> and I'm sure there were other, other <laughs> antics. Um, you told me that yourself. Yes. Uh, but before, um, <laughs> Before I reflect on the inherently political story of making a place for Puerto Rican history in the academy, I want to speak for a few minutes uh, on the earlier history of Puerto Ricans here in, in New York um, and how the dimensions of that history were always already political. Um, the first point in, in relation to that history is the, the racial inflection of Puerto Ricans' US citizenship that limited their rights as United States citizens and marked their history. Um, as U.S. citizens, the rights and protections that Puerto Ricans uh, supposedly enjoyed included the ab ability to vote um, for politicians to represent their interests and the right to collect state-sponsored social benefits, among other things, in the 1930s. Um, but the reality for Puerto Ricans in the U.S. and also for African Americans in that period was that in most cases these rights and protections never materialized or could only be attained through um, sustained struggle and conflict. So by the time the Great Depression hit, Puerto Rican migrants were self-consciously striving against mounting odds to secure for themselves the version of US citizenship they wanted, which was that enjoyed primarily exclusively by whites, um, not the inferior citizenship of their African American neighbors in the many neighborhoods uh, they occupied in New York. So in 1935, uh, at a moment of, of heightened worry about race in the Puerto Rican colonia, a riot in Harlem reminded Puerto Ricans of the likelihood of their being categorized with African Americans and limited in their citizenship. Um, the riot, which would become famous as the Harlem Riot of 1935, had begun with the arrest of a Puerto Rican boy accused of stealing in a Crest store on 125th Street. Um, and what followed involved a case of mistaken identity. Um, so this is a, uh, like a pretty poor photocopy of a circular, this is in La Prensa, that, which reproduced the circular um, created by uh, a couple of political groups in Harlem, the Young Communist League and the Young Liber Liberators, um, who, who said that a 12-year-old Negro boy was brutally beaten by the managers of the Crest 5 and 10, um, 10 cent store. And you see the, the ways that <coughs> he is represented in these quotes. Um, so there was this kind of blurring of who this boy was. There was a presumption that he was Negro um, because he had been in Harlem and, and many people didn't even realize that there was a, a Puerto Rican community in Harlem. The Brooklyn Daily Eagle, when it reported on the riot, headlined, uh, warned of a race war. Um, La Prensa reporters, on the other hand, implied that the disturbances, they downplayed the disturbances, and uh, implied that they were attributed, um, attributable only to gente de color americana distancing themselves from what it was happening, distancing the Puerto Rican community from what was happening. And Puerto Ricans in the community were, were unsure of where to situate themselves in the context of this conflict. Were they to be categorized at, as the same kind of minority population as African Americans without, they increasingly saw, the rights of real citizenship, and what would that mean? So looking critically at the, uh, the narratives of the riot through the lens of this, um, this uh, racial identity and power, highlights the importance of Puerto Ricans as um, central, if not very visible, political actors in New York starting from the early 30s. Um, and their identity as colonial citizens was another limiting factor in this time period. Um, the other centrally, intrinsically political theme in this era of Puerto Rican history I want to highlight is the problem of colonialism and its diffuse um, but powerful impact on Puerto Ricans in the US. Um, here's how the legal scholar and judge Jose Cabranes connected the dots between um, citizenship and colonial 
journalism in a 1979 article that he's pretty well known for. I won't read it, let you read it. Um, so this was kind of a circular problem as he presents it, a closed system of exploitation and domination. The second class citizenship that he identifies was something that politicized migrants had actually been talking about since the 1930s. Um, but their objections, their critiques uh, were utterly silenced in US public discourse, as we might expect. Here, oops, skipping that one. This was um, a comment by a letter writer to La Prensa, a nationalist activist, actually. Um, and the way she framed the problem of citizenship in the United States. And it, it's in bold because it was actually um, emphasized in, in bolder italics in the letter that she wrote. So now jumping ahead, far ahead a few decades to the 1960s when second class citizenship became a problem fully articulated by Puerto Ricans and on a much larger scale was now these objections, these critiques, were finally heard at least somewhat in the broader public sphere. Um, Frederick Jameson, the literary critic, would later describe the 60s as the period in which, quote, all these third world natives and those inner colonized of the first world became human beings, autonomous subjects at last. So the so-called inner colonized of New York's barrios, whose families had come from an actual colony, now seized on every opportunity to link their local experience of oppression to the larger problem of colonialism. Most uh, politicized Puerto Rican youth were saying this in some form by the mid-60s. Um, those who, along with uh, Chicano and African-American activists, sought to hold their liberal democratic society accountable for its violent exclusions and oppressions of so-called minority peoples. The Young Lords organization created this document Activists and intellectuals were already pushing beyond the goals of simply connecting their history to questions of political power. As the Lord's 13 point program shows, or the section I show you here, the narrative of, of Puerto Rican history for those who were listening took care of that by itself. The more comprehensive goal of Puerto Rican activists in the academy by the late 60s was to make Puerto Rican history political in a new way by challenging the academy to recognize the centrality of people marginalized by their racial and colonial status. So the fight to create these uh, new e ethnic studies departments actually started in the streets, of, of course, um, amid the social movements of the 1960s. Um, in fact, and, and now I'm going back just a little bit again, the first activist trend that paved the way for the development of Puerto Rican studies in the academy was community organizing to increase educational opportunity earlier in the decade. Um, well, actually even dates back to the, to the late 1950s. Um, just for example, a group calling itself the Hispanic Association of Pro Higher Education, who's actually a, a, Puerto, a <coughs> Puerto Rican, a group of, of young high school and college age Puerto Rican um, students, founded in 1959, sponsored a series of annual conferences for Puerto Rican youth throughout the 60s. Here's a statement from the second Puerto Rican Youth Conference in 1960. Their goal was, quote, to set a positive image to counter pathology and fear, that's in quotes, to show Puerto Ricans as ambitious with a desire and increasing ability to climb upwards, as have all past newcomers to the city. The group held the events at high profile institutions like the Dalton School at Hunter College in Columbia, a sign of its determination to be recognized within the city's mainstream educational establishment. And then there was the work of so many activists pushing for justice in education by the early 60s, many of them parents of school children. Foremost among these, of course, was Evelina Lopez Antonetti, who founded United Bronx Parents in 1965 and also pushed for Head Start programs in uh, Puerto Rican communities um, around that time. So thousands of Puerto Rican parents got involved in various battles over community control of public schools, in the face of what seemed to them to be contradictory and racist programs of integration. And these battles turned into a movement in itself. The other dimensions of what would become a real Puerto Rican movement were increasingly visible in the streets as well. 
and increasingly visible after the riot in 1967 in El Radio. <coughs> By that point, young Puerto Ricans were assembling in storefronts and back rooms and tenement apartments all around the community and the Lower East Side, uh, forming groups uh, focused on community action, like the Young Lords, the Real Great Society, many others, pushing for uh, rights to better housing, employment, and uh, better schooling. There were also a growing number of organizations started by Puerto Rican college students, many of them in the city university colleges, almost all of them the first in their families to attend college. Here's what activist Iris Morales recalled about her cohort of black and Puerto Rican students at CUNY in the late 60s. We were marginalized and we tended to stick together, united by common experiences of poverty and racial oppression. Many of these students had been influenced by black power ideology, often while still in high school, before starting their own radical Puerto Rican organizations. These student activists formed groups like Sociedad Albizu Campos and the citywide Puerto Rican Student Union and started planning major actions to revamp CUNY's curriculum. Activists wanted to see greater acknowledgement of Puerto Rican issues on their campuses, greater access for Puerto Rican students, as well as a commitment to teaching Puerto Rican history and culture at the university level. Their organizing led to scores of protests and a handful of takeovers at various CUNY campuses in April, starting in April 1969, in conjunction with African American students pushing for the same demands. The success of this action on the part of students represented a major convergence of the grassroots and the academy. Just a couple of months before the City College takeover, feminist Carol Hanish, also from New York City, had written what would become a famous memo on the feminist movement, arguing that, quote, the personal was political. Black and Puerto Rican student activists were arguing that the academic was also political. That is, among other things, that the poverty and racial oppression that Iris Morales and, of course, thousands of others uh, talked about were issues now deemed worthy of study in the academy across the university. So the academic was political in many dimensions, um, and uh, the, the following few points outlined uh, the rest of my remarks. It was political in shifting not just into institutional but epistemological power dynamics to acknowledge a silenced history in academia. The academic was political in creating access for a largely oppressed community to connect to institutions that provided the surest access to social power, which was higher education. The academic was political in filling the vast lacunae of knowledge about Puerto Rican history and heritage, <coughs> in challenging bad scholarship by respected academics and replacing their flawed, inaccurate, incomplete, condescending, racist insights, not all of them were all of those things, but some combination, with knowledge of the group by its own members. And finally, the academic was political in setting an agenda that, though for a long time little acknowledged outside Puerto Rican studies itself, pushed other scholars in other fields to think in new ways about big processes like colonialism, globalization, transnationalism. So I'm going to talk about each of these dimensions um, in a, a little bit more detail. So the, it was uh, the creation of Puerto Rican studies departments involved the inherently political act of demanding to have Puerto Rican history acknowledged in the academy. Um, in the spring of 1969, as I mentioned, and as most of you know, many of you maybe, or some of you maybe um, took part in this, hundreds of African American and Puerto Rican students occupied the City College campus, demanding a handful of major changes from the CUNY administration, of which I'll just focus on two a more equitable representation of students of color admitted to the CUNY colleges, and the, degree, uh, the creation of degree-granting programs in third world studies, eventually it would become uh, separate departments of black studies and Puerto Rican studies. Open admissions, which were the eventual result by 1970 of negotiations of CUNY administration in response to these student demands, um, changed not just higher education, but began to shift the goals and opportunities of secondary and even primary education in the city thereafter. Um, the creation of Puerto Rican studies departments in 17 of the 19 campuses in the CUNY system between 1969 and 1973 
the first of which, as you all know, was right here at Lehman College, plus the first incarnation of Boricua College and the founding of the Center for Puerto Rican Studies. All of that did not just change the opportunities for Puerto Rican students to study themselves, as one critic complained during the takeover in 1969. They also created a new visibility that opened the eyes of students, faculty, and administrators who would have otherwise ignored the silenced histories of their minority compatriots or fellow students. I'm going to give you just two quick Ivy League examples. Um, at Columbia, a Puerto Rican studies program was created in 1971. Um, I saw a newspaper article where there was a conflict reported about how to manage it within the college, and I saw the name of a college dean who would, would uh, turn out to be my literature humanities teacher my first semester at Columbia in 1989. That was a bit of a surprise. Um, and at Harvard, I just read an article this week in the Harvard Crimson, Crimson many, many of you may have seen it, um, about the university's repeated refusal over a, port, a period of 40 years to establish a Puerto Rican or Latino studies program. So these programs represented new sites of academic inquiry, pulling together scholars in a variety of fields and created new possibilities for asking intellectual questions about Puerto Ricans that could be relevant both to their community and to the expansion of knowledge in all the disciplines in which Puerto Rican studies scholars were trained. This is um, taken from a document written by the Committee for Puerto Rican Studies in 1972. It's <coughs> quoted in an article that Nelly Duc Perez wrote in the Central Journal um, a few years ago about the creation of the Central Library and Archive. Um, so, all right, I'll leave that up here. Uh, connecting the academy and the community is the next thing I want to consider. Creating access for a largely oppressed community at that time to connect to institutions that provided the surest access to social power higher through higher education. So the takeover succeeded in part. Many of its um, um, many of its proponents argued, in part because it had so much community support. One result of the takeover in New York was that CUNY implemented, as I mentioned, open admissions, which it had. had apparently been planning to do by 1975, um, but in a negotiated response to the students' demands, the university um, pushed that ahead to 1970. And I'll say a little bit more on this since it was a central component of trying to connect the academic, um, connect academic to community concerns. Open admissions um, per se was not in fact one of the original demands of the student protesters. Rather, they wanted fair access for students in poor neighborhoods and equal representation of black and Puerto Rican students on city university campuses. Um, in hammering out the details on this particular conflict that spring, City College admissions became poli a political hot potato um, even for the mayoral candidates. Um, Herman Badillo was running against incumbent Mayor John Lindsay, also against Wagner who was running again and Norman Mailer and one or two others. Uh, these candidates actually debated the initial proposal by black and Puerto Rican students um, which was a two-tiered admissions program, whereby 50% of students admitted to City College would be drawn from poor neighborhoods without regard to grades or other qualifications. Opponents of this version of the admissions plan um, dubbed it slum admissions and rejected it as a quota system. Um, Badillo offered a more careful critique, pushing for a more measured openness to the city's public colleges and saying forcefully that the place to start pushing for opening educational access was attacking the, quote, dual system of education that had impeded black and Puerto Rican kids, especially the vocational diploma and the so-called general diploma, as opposed to the academic diploma, um, that so many Puerto Rican students were discouraged from pursuing. So eventually, by 1970, 1970 the proposed changes in admissions were revised to become the open admissions policy. The fight over changing admissions policy policies in whatever form to enable access to the communities of the city that had lacked access to higher ed was a fight to connect the community and the academy. And this meant not just making the academy accessible to Puerto Ricans, but also <coughs> relevant to them. Here's an observation of, of Frank Bonilla, longtime director of the Central, about connecting the university 
And I really like his phrase, the performance of intellectual work of import to this Puerto Rican community. So my last set of points will be an elaboration of what I see as three categories of intellectual work of import to this Puerto Rican community. Um, the first is, the filling, is filling the lacuna of academic knowledge that is accurate and analytical knowledge about Puerto Ricans based on a combination of community history and memory on the one hand and sensitive scholarly interpretation on the other. In this area, I think we all know the work of hundreds of people building the collections of the Central Library and Archives during the last 38 years has been unparalleled. I'm going to just, oops, uh oh. I jumped ahead. Oh well, never mind. <laughs> I'm, uh, I, I, I'm short on time, so I'm going to skip ahead. Um, the second category of intellectual work Bonilla talked about is challenging um, bad scholarship that misrepresents the history and significance of Puerto Ricans' experience in the United States. Um, and I'm just going to give you a, a couple of examples from the period immediately preceding the creation of, of most Puerto Rican studies departments in New York. Um, uh, well-known scholars like the historian Oscar Handlin, whose discussions of Puerto Ricans and their socioeconomic stagnation in his 1959 book, The Newcomers, um, paid close attention to the structural disadvantages they faced. It was not bad scholarship all the way through. Um, he focused on discrimination in housing and employment. But Hanlon's research was glaringly thin in, in many places, leading him to reproduce in spades the stereotypes about Puerto Ricans' political apathy, their, quote, lack of associational life, the, quote, tragically rare instances of Puerto Ricans who were willing and able to exercise creative leadership. And then there was Glazer and Moynihan, who in their uh, introduction to the 1970 edition of their 1963 book, Beyond the Melting Pot, um, criticized young Puerto Rican activists for their militant actions in CUNY, but at the same time wrote them off as historically insignificant, implying that they were incapable of developing their own political analysis. And here's a quote um, that, uh, that Glazer and Moynihan made about student radicals in 1970. The radical white college youth, who are, not so, uh, who are now so influential in the mass media, will try to convince them that they are colonized. So in other words, he's saying students for democratic society or, or the, anti, the white students in the anti-war movement would have to convince uh, Puerto Rican activists that they were colonized. <laughs> an amazing um, misapprehension at best. So the members of the History Task Force at the Center for Puerto Rican Studies in the late 70s confronted head on the impoverishment of such ideas. They criticized other scholars for broadcasting over and over, quote, the stale news of the stagnation of the poor. They promoted a research agenda that would examine the structural basis of poverty, and yes, examine some of the social and cultural impl implications of that research, but on terms set within the field and within their communities. Situating poverty in a history that paid close attention to big structural processes, beginning with the political economy of colonialism and migration, and also paying close attention to complex social relationships to achieve recognition as equals in the United States. In doing so, Puerto Rican intellectuals in this era made interpretive links that Juan Flores has argued are crucial to social theory in general connecting the origins of social conflict to, quote, a broad theory of geopolitical and social power capable of registering differential kinds and conditions of relationality. In that sense, groups like the History Task Force at Centro insisted on opening to the academy ideas that were still then avant-garde, the persistent weight of colonialism, the powerfully transnational cultures of Latin American peoples in the United States, and the far-reaching impact of the global economy. Few scholars outside of ethnic studies were listening, though, or if they were listening, they somehow managed, really up through the 80s, to dismiss this work as identity politics. And that is, I think, as we all know, um, quite a mistake. Scholars in Puerto Rican studies and in ethnic studies fields of all kinds continue to be asked to justify the value of the work they do and continue to struggle <coughs> to share their invaluable insights, 40 years of invaluable insights, with audiences beyond the field. Um, 
I'm not going to uh, be Pollyannaish, I think, but I do think we've seen an opening in the last 20 years, 10 years certainly, um, and the momentum is increasing to connect fields like Puerto Rican studies with any other academic discipline um, and to have the knowledge flowing both ways. We now see that at least see real debates about the political dimensions of Puerto Rican experience in the United States. I mean, I don't have to, um, I mean, the first example that comes to mind is, is Sonia Sotomayor's quote about the wise Latina and, and forcing the public to consider at least the, um, the significance of subjective experience in connection with uh, political analysis and historical analysis. Um, we see broad student demand for Latino and Puerto Rican studies courses. It's another um, change. We see prestigious presses publishing work in uh, uh, Puerto Rican studies, Latino studies, um, in series that are not just, um, this is my book is certainly um, one of these, in series that are not just um, confined to ethnic studies, so-called. The one central important thing still to do, I think, um, is to continue to pursue access to higher education for disadvantaged students, um, still up underrepresented in the academy, and um, whether or not they are citizens of this country. And I thank um, all of the, uh, the, the avant-garde in this field for helping to teach us these things. Thank you, Professor Thomas. Uh, before we proceed to President uh, Fernandez and the, the plaque, um, I'd like to take a few questions from the audience. Uh, could I just ask you to um, come up here so we can get you on camera and we can hear you a little more clearly, but don't be bashful. In fact, anybody, um, you can just go ahead and uh, form a line here. Yes. Uh, Professor Lauren, I was wondering if, Professor Thomas, pardon, I was wondering if you could elaborate on your comment about the identity politics and uh, your follow-up comment about what a mistake that is? Um, what I meant to, what, what I, what I meant is that I think that especially by the 1980s there was a sense that um, Scholars in ethnic studies were still fighting for the relevance of what they were doing, and one way in, I mean, in the, the, the dialogue of the culture wars of that era, one way that the work of scholars in fields like Puerto Rican studies could be dismissed, or at least um, kind of confined to a small place, was to call it identity politics, to say it's only relevant for your group. I'm not, like that quote uh, from the Observer in a newspaper that I read in, in 1969, that these Puerto Rican students only wanted to study themselves, as if that were um, the only important thing, and and it's a, a way of of diminishing the significance of the work that that Puerto Rican studies and other ethnic studies scholars do. And I would just add, for those who may not be familiar with the Puerto Rican diaspora. It really covers many different type of things. So you were uh, covering a particular part of it uh, following the Great Migration. But those of us who are part of the diaspora, we have all different levels of uh, having arrived here. So it's, uh, this whole theme of migration is very uh, near and dear to us. And uh, when people came over and then how they established community is a very important issue. So this era in the 1960s was certainly uh, a key one. Um, I was wondering about your, your, what you had in mind for the title when you're, uh, of your talk, Puerto Rican History is Political History? Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a general argument that there is no way in which the history of Puerto Rico or the history of its people can be understood as not political. There's no corner of Puerto Rican history that does not have some political significance because of the um, power dynamics of colonialism. Um, and uh, the past and present relationship of its people to the United States. Uh, how many people are actually part of the Puerto Rican diaspora? 
Okay, so there are, there are quite a few of us. And uh, it's interesting because we come at different times. My, uh, my dad came in 1941, uh, which is just the beginning of the Great Migration. And we have people, uh, Javier, when did, when did you come? You ever did the No, no, just, <laughs> just a year, just a year. 1973. So that was a whole different movement. And uh, so, as I say, for those of us who've been through it, it's a very important uh, step in, uh, in our identity and uh, all the different aspects of it. Uh, is there any, any other questions from the audience? Juan? Um, this is Juan de la Cruz from the Economics Department. Uh, we know that the um, Hispanic population is rising in the United States. And although, well, although it's rising, um, we are heavily underrepresented in many aspects of academia, health is not good, so many things that, that are playing against us. What should we do? <laughs> if we break down, if, if we break this down in... Uh, historians only look backward, we don't really look forward. <laughs> no, but I mean, the, la the last thing, history. the... the, the less optimistic note that I ended on is about access to higher education. And I have a more complicated, actually, position on higher education in general. But um, in other words, people shouldn't necessarily need it in order to survive economically. But access to decent education that will prepare them for some kind of stable livelihood is um, that's the weak link, and that's the thing I think we, we all need to be fighting for at, at all different levels. I mean, there's not, um, there's not a way, I think, to limit, you know, there's no, um, I'll leave it at that. Um, any other questions? Uh, Alicia, would you? So um, there have been uh, efforts to limit ethnic studies in other parts of the country. The Mexican-American Studies program was removed from the K-12 um, uh, Tucson right. school curriculum. Yeah. And now there's attacks headed towards the University of Arizona's um, undergraduate curriculum mm -hmm. in Mexican and Mexican-American Studies. Do you think that, um, that we're going to see uh, a situation in the United States of certain states uh, reinforcing their commitment to ethnic studies at the same time that others are dismantling it, or is this just part of the long-term cycle of ebbing and flowing of uh, no? I think it's more about a bifurcation than a than a cyclical. I mean, I, and what I mean is that in states like Arizona, the presence of Latinos and Latin Americans is so um, politicized, and there are enough people who are angry about sharing their space and their jobs and their communities um, that they want to see, it seems to me, they want to see no, uh, no representation or no, no um, sign of further empowerment of these communities in their, in their midst. Um, the, the East Coast, well, I guess California is sort of potentially in the middle, and I don't know that, that state level politics and cultural politics quite as well. Um, I mean, there are uh, kind of economic assaults on area studies programs and ethnic studies programs all over the place. But I also think that we, um, you know, as I said in, in some of my conclusions, that there's, there's at the same time an amazing momentum and, and connecting across, like, you know, beyond um, Latino studies, beyond Puerto Rican studies, to um, Latin American studies, and, and, and institutionally, um, we are so much more connected to our colleagues in, in, in other parts of the university and other disciplines that I, it, maybe I'm too optimistic, but I don't see it as something intellectually or institutionally that can be rolled back um, in that way. So. Well, thank you uh, once again for this uh, little talk. Uh, one quick one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Well, <laughs> the people of Puerto Rico have to grapple with how increasingly difficult that question is. I mean, the Commonwealth has been around for 60 years. It's been a colony for 114 years. Um, and I don't, I can't make any recommendations about it. My, my, my main recommendation is to um, be sure that in any kind of political conversation about this, certainly on the island, that's obvious, but, but here in the United States, where there are not many conversations about it, is to um, call it what it is. I mean, to call it a colony and to talk about the dilemmas of that status from that standpoint. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks again. And uh, now we'd like to move to uh, welcome our esteemed president, um, uh, Ricardo Fernandez, who is going to present the, um, the plaque to Professor Tote. And uh, around here, uh, Ricardo Fernandez needs no introduction, and he's been uh, very helpful to our department, the Latin American Puerto Rican Studies Department, and to the entire university. And we're we're very proud to have him here, and uh, thank you very much for attending. Thank, thank you, David. Um, before I do the formal part, uh, some of you know me, but some of you don't know me. So I'd like to tell you a little bit of my thoughts as I have listened to certainly the last part of the presentation. Um, I'm also part of this diaspora, um, having come here in the late 1950s. I'm probably one of the oldest people in this room. Uh, and I didn't come to New York. I came to the Midwest. I came to a city uh, called Milwaukee because I was a baseball player and I wanted to be in a place that had a real good baseball team. And they did back then. And it's interesting, I met, the first people I met locally were Mexicans or Mexican-Americans, a lot of uh, settled out migrant workers. I remember I had never had refried beans. It's like going, I mean, beans mashed and, and it was, I mean, I love them. I mean, <laughs> but it was, a, it, was a, it was a change for me. And then, um, some of the earliest uh, recollections of ethnic studies came, first of all, uh, black studies, because that really was the main impulse, at least in US institutions all over the country. Black studies programs were involved. We all have images of black students walking out of Cornell University's administration building with rifles in their hands. It was a very militant kind of thing. Kent State, where people were, students were shot and killed by the National Guard. It was, it was a very difficult, traumatic time for, for the United States. And that's when a lot of these movements were beginning to, to take root on campuses, of, uh, simulated in part by black studies and black militants. So the first people I ever heard of were Chicanos. And I, I didn't even understand what that was. Um, and magazines like El Grito, there was a magazine that came out of Berkeley by a, a man by the name of Octavio Romano, an anthropologist, I think. And he actually created this almost single-handedly with the help of a few uh, faculty. And then there were uh, departments of Chicano studies that began to sprout in different places, in UCLA and then in Texas and in other other locations across the country. Uh, but those were the, my first real connection with ethnic studies. I knew about stuff happening in New York because I had met Frank Bonilla uh, in the early 70s. And uh, I was a faculty member at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee at that point. And Frank, of course, had just begun the work of the Centro. And there were these task forces that were active publishing in areas of language and politics and a number of other areas, the arts. And I would um, hear about them and maybe even get some of these publications. Later on in the early 80s, I became formally connected with New York 
because I didn't really know very many people here, except Frank and uh, people like Maria Canino, uh, who later became a CUNY uh, trustee, and uh, Pedro Pedraza, and some of the people in the, in the, in the library and the Centro, and Frank, of course. Uh, but later, I became a member of the board of the Puerto Rican Legal Defense and Education Fund. I was doing work directing a center that had to provide services on request to school districts to help them develop plans to serve students of limited English proficiency. And this was in the context of school desegregation, which was something I didn't really know very much about, but it led me to begin to study and read about the black experience, the struggle against slavery and segregation and the impact that that has had in the identity and the, you know, the history of, of, of this country, not just of the black uh, population, the African-American population. So it was, it was in that context that I started, uh, I, I guess, acquiring a much more, a broader understanding of the issues of ethnicity in American education. I would teach graduate courses. I remember doing a seminar on ethnicity and we had a series of Prentice Hall books on ethnicity in American life, which included Joe Fitzpatrick's book, Puerto Rican Americans, which some of my friends thought was um, not an appropriate title. <laughs> they wanted to forget the American part and just say Puerto Ricans, because they were books. Joan Moore wrote a book about Mexican Americans and a uh, number of, there were books about blacks, about Italian Americans. It was the, the ethnic groups in American life at that point. Michael Novak wrote about the rise of the unmeltable ethnics. So it was a very uh, intellectually stimulating moment in, in American uh, higher education and in American society. Eventually, uh, I started doing a study of the dropout problem among Puerto Ricans and among Hispanic, not just Puerto Ricans, funded by uh, the Inter Interuniversity Program for Latino Research. Uh, Frank actually was part of the panel that awarded that grant. And we included uh, districts, uh, uh, schools in San Antonio, in Miami, in New York, in Chicago, in Milwaukee, because we wanted to have an idea, uh, really a, a national representation of Hispanic students. And uh, it, so it was, it was really then that I uh, got more, much more connected with people and institutions here in the city of, of New York. Prior to that, and in fact, most of my contacts were out in the West and the Southwest with, among Mexican Americans and even in Miami with some Cubans at Florida International University. So when I came to Lehman in 1990, uh, as the first Latino president of a four-year school in New York State, this is 1990, okay? This is not 1960 or 70. Uh, things have changed somewhat since then, but it was, it was a very limited access to certain positions. And frankly, some of this happened by serendipity. That's the way it works. Uh, so since then, obviously, we've made some real progress as a, as a community. We have now, I guess, more Puerto Ricans living in the United States than in Puerto Rico. And some of the things have changed, but some of the things haven't really changed. Um, at any rate, I, my, my point, I wanted to share some of that because I've been writing um, a chapter for a book that I've been asked to write. I'm one of about 18 different uh, presidents of Hispanic, Latino presidents of colleges and universities across the country. And um, a couple of people, a fellow at the Julian Zamora Center in Michigan State, is compiling the book. So he asked me to write about uh, my experience in higher ed and how I got to become president and then some of the good things that I've done and some of the screw-ups that I have 
been that I have made, which which are a few. No question about that. <laughs> In fact, I just finished writing about two of them. Uh, and you know, so it's it's it gives me a, a chance to reflect and really a lot of this stuff is very vivid in my mind because I've been thinking and reading and rereading and looking back at letters and photographs and other kinds of documents that I have had to uh, examine in preparation for this. But one of the things that I'm very proud of is that the Journal of the Centro is, has always been a quality publication. And since Javier Totti, a member of this institution for many, many years, he was here before I got here, um, <laughs> I've been here 22 years, so I don't know. I don't know how long, but I remember he was a student of Eric Wolf, the, the eminent anthropologist. Uh, and Javier always had this this proclivity, or maybe I don't know, tendency. He, you know, he he likes doing this type of work. I myself was the editor for a very short period of the of a journal called the Rican, the Journal of Contemporary Puerto Rican Thought which uh, Samuel Betanz and my good friend uh, published, started in Chicago. And since I was in Milwaukee, we were able to collaborate uh, and do a lot of joint work. It didn't last very long, but uh, I enjoyed doing that. And I've always kept a little bit of that editor's perspective. So it is with special appreciation that I uh, readily agreed to present this plaque uh, to Javier from the department and from the Centro uh, and from me personally, I think, because he has done a yeoman's job of, as an editor. It's a painless, thankless job. Sometimes you get manuscripts that you just want to throw out, <laughs> but you can't do that. You have to edit them, you have to clean them up, and you have to present them and put them in a way, and so people read them they say, wow, isn't this wonderful? That faculty member or person needs to be congratulated. The person who really needs to be congratulated is the editor, in this case, Javier Totti. So without further ado, this is in recognition of 10 years of dedicated and productive service as managing editor of Centro, Journal of the Center for Puerto Rican Studies. Continue with the panel, uh, Andres. Uh, if you can come up here and, and start, uh, we're going to have a discussion. Uh, if the panelists can come up uh, while we're doing a photo op here, and I know some of you had some questions earlier. We will get to them. We're going to have brief presentations. And thank you very much, President Fernandez, for for coming by. We know you have a, a busy schedule. So um, Andres Torres is a, a faculty member at uh, Latin American Puerto Rican. Edgardo, come on, we're going to do a little uh, musical chairs here. Um, and um, just while we're doing this, just to fill a little time here, the, the question of the Puerto Rican diaspora um, has a lot of issues about who's doing the studying, too. So we always welcome different perspectives. So you're going to hear how the uh, Centro Journal uh, function and how it operates and how we go about um, studying the whole experience. So, uh, and you can see that uh, Javier has tremendous responsibilities and uh, he's really done a great job on the journal. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to uh, Professor Torres. Please welcome. So, uh, 
some of our students had to leave, thanks for hanging out. If you can hang on further, even better. Uh, we're going to continue to shine a little more light on uh, Javier, uh, having him talk a little uh, more and re uh, reflecting on his experience. He probably is uh, concerned that with each additional person who uh, uh, gets up here, he gets older and older because uh, I, too, <laughs> remember him uh, from from way back and we have worked together in different settings and he has been kind enough to edit some of my manuscripts uh, over the years as well. So uh, my role here is uh, quite brief. I just want to give you some background information on our panel. Uh, this panel is to now uh, hear what it, the reflections of a, of a great managing editor uh, are and some uh, feedback or auxiliary commentary from two of his colleagues as well. So, Professor Javier Totti, to once again uh, tell you who he is, has been on the Lehman College faculty since the early, I had early 90s, but now I guess uh, it's been before. Uh, early 90s. Early 90s, okay. <laughs> he still hasn't aged yet. He was director of Lehman's bilingual program and has been a mainstay of the Latin American and Puerto Rican Studies Department since that time. <laughs> For the last decade, he has also served as editor of the award-winning Centro Journal, a leaning periodical in the Latino studies field. Centro Journal is published by El Centro de Estudios Puerto Ricanos, based at Hunter College. Professor Totti has published on issues relating to health in Puerto Rico, political myths in Brazil, Puerto Rican political activism in the United States, Puerto Rican anthropology, and Latino identity. Joining us also is Dr. Arlene Torres, no relation. She is an associate professor in the Department of Africana and Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College. Torres is a cultural anthropologist with expertise in Caribbean, Latina, Latino, and Latin American studies. She is also the director of the Chancellor's Cooney Latino Faculty Initiative. She received her PhD and master's degrees in anthropology from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign where she held positions as an administrator and member of the faculty. Prior to her arrival in CUNY a few years ago, she served as director of the Latina Latino Studies Program at Illinois and as associate professor of anthropology. In her varied roles, she worked on the recruitment and retention of university administrators, faculty, and graduate students. She has held appointments and received fellowships from the Rockefeller Foundation the Smithsonian Institute, and Princeton University. Her publications include two edited volumes with Norman E. Witten, Jr., Blackness in Latin America and the Caribbean. Among her current research work is a study on the racialization of ethnic groups in museum settings. Professor Edgardo Melendez, we go back even further than Javier and I, <laughs> is full professor in the Department of Africana and Puerto Rican Studies, also at Hunter College. He earned his PhD in political science right here in homegrown territory at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. He has also taught at the University of Connecticut Stores, Lehman College Cooney, and City College Cooney, among other colleges. He was at the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras, before coming to Hunter College. This is the kind of uh, bio now where you have to hold your breath when you're reading their publications, so here I go. His publications include Puerto Rican Government and Politics, a Comprehensive Bibliography, Partidos, Política Pública y Estatus en Puerto Rico, Movimiento Anexionista en Puerto Rico. These are all different publications. Books, a Colonial Dilemma, Critical Perspectives on Contemporary Puerto Rico, co-edited with Edwin Melendez and Puerto Rico's statehood movement. He is currently writing a book on the Puerto Rican migration and politics in Puerto Rico and the United States, 1940 to 1950. This is our wonderful little panel today.
So um, I turn the table over to the podium over to uh, Javier. Uh, just personally, today we honor him for his dedicated service to Centro Journal. We are sure that his many students over the years and his appreciative colleagues throughout the United States, Puerto Rico, and beyond share with us a deep sense of gratitude for Javier's commitment to the fields of Puerto Rican and Latino studies. Javier. I'll, I'll say five words in crescendo. Gracias, muchas gracias, muchísimas gracias <laughs> for all of this. Um, in, in a way, I think that they propose me, my colleagues in the department, because I have an espresso machine in my office and I give them all coffee every time. <laughs> so maybe <laughs> this is the payment back. Um, so, but thank you anyways. Um, all journals are born out of a struggle and all journals are born because someone wants to say something and say it loudly and they're looking for space. And this is true for any kind of journal, but in the case of jur journals that are ethnic based, ethnic studies journal, that something to say becomes a screen because there are very few outlets that allow or that let newcomers you know, sit at the table. So the origins of Central Journal are, are really combative in that sense. When it was created, it was to give uh, scholars that dealt with the field of Puerto Rican studies a voice, a place where they could say their piece because other places were not allowing it. It wasn't part of the official agenda or the policy of other journals. So in that sense, that's how it was born. I could, wouldn't be here. One always stands on the shoulders of others. I couldn't be, wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the two other editors of the journal, uh, Miriam Jimenez Roman and Blanca Vasquez, who created and kept the journal coming for years before I got here. So they also deserve, uh, deserve thanks. The journal, as it was imagined, and it's good that Ricardo mentioned, the Rican, the journal was imagined as following the footsteps of journals like the Black Scholar and actually the Rican. And that's why if you take a look at the journal, it has graphics and, and it's multidisciplinary and it sometimes includes poetry or prose, et cetera, and it follows that pattern of those other uh, of those other journals you know, that had an impact, and of course El Grito uh, from Berkeley. Um, I'm always looking for manuscripts, and an editor is always looks for manuscripts. You're always badgering people to give you their to give you their work. Um, you're always journals, academic journals, will not exist without the selfless, altruistic work of other colleagues who read the essays for no pay, uh, for authors who submit their work for no money either. Uh, so it's part really of the, of the commitment that scholars have to the discipline, that they do all of this work for free, that they get buyer by editors to hand in their reviews on time or their revisions on time, et cetera, and they do it selflessly. And they also deserve a lot of credit and a lot of thanks because without them, there would be no dance. There would be no academic journals. Um, and, and that's important to remember. Um, you know, when I got to the Central Journal, we were publishing the special issue on Chicago, on the Puerto Rican community in Chicago. And the previous editor had worked on that. I did some of the essays, et cetera. But she basically handed me almost a finish uh, work, um, but there was no other essays in, in line, so I had to really go out scrunching for you know what I'm going to publish next because there was nothing in, on file. Um, I went to the director of the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, Felix Matos, who today right is the president of Hostos Community College, and told him, "Look, fellow, why did you bring me here? Because I, there's nothing. I can't do a thing." Um, so I set out, I mean, went out into the wilderness to try to <laughs> beat the bushes to get essays. I'm an anthropologist, and you, when I was in my doctoral work, you always read, you had to read the British School of Anthropology and how they 
did most of their work in Africa. And all of these British anthropologists in the 30s and 40s will comment that they were waiting for a funeral in their communities, or kin-based communities, especially in East Africa. They're waiting for a funeral for someone important to die because then the whole kinship structure, everyone who is related to that person will come and they could then figure out the political structure of the community. Sort of like a similar thing happens when the FBI, when a big mafioso da dies and the FBI goes to the funeral to watch who comes to the funeral and who pays homage and where they're standing and then tells them their rank. I was, I don't want to, this might sound horrible, but I'll say it anyway. I mean, um, my case, I had no essays. And <laughs> I found out that a well-known, I had actually used his books here at, at Lima, and a well-known Puerto Rican writer, Eduard Rivera, had just died. Uh, he's the author of Family Installment, a very interesting novel. It was marketed as a memoir, but it's really a novel, fiction on Puerto Rican life in growing up Puerto Rican in the United States in the 1950s and 60s. And sort of like a light bulb lit in my head, I said, okay, this, Edward Rivera, I'm very sorry. I mean, I use your book. I'm so sorry that you died, but this is my opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> and I created, I decided, I created a special issue in his honor. And surprisingly, all of these scholars who were out there heard of it and began to send in their work. And they were all incredibly appreciative because Edward Rivera had never been honored, had never been recognized for his value. He was also a quirky person, so he didn't like honors or anything like that. But he, had, he was almost, almost unknown by the time he died. And that really saved me. I still needed some more space. I mean, I still had some more open space. And this is where I meet my, our, the department's chairperson, Licia Fiol. Because Licia submits a very well, a very interesting paper that has been incredibly well cited to the journal. And, um, and I badger everyone, all my reviewers, to hand, me in, hand in their reviews on time. And the journal came out on time. And since that time, it has always come out on time. There have been bumps along the road. There have been uh, times when articles, essays that I loved, that I thought were magnificent, were rejected by reviewers, and that was sort of like a big blow to my, to me, because I wanted to publish those articles. And then to see them published elsewhere, you sort of like have to swallow hard. There were other times when essays that I thought were simply horrible went through the review process and were accepted and published. Uh, so you have to take one, um, one with the other. Um, one of my biggest frustrations has, is that a special issue that we were preparing on Puerto Rican migration in the 1950s fell through because there were not enough scholars um, working the area or working the topic that sent their, their essays. So we'll get to it back again and we'll reinvent it and, and throw it in again. In today's world, academic journalists there is sort of like this dark cloud coming into academic journals that where we're being judged by what is called impact factor, the citation impact factor. And this is very popular in the sciences, in the hard sciences, um, and not so popular in the humanities and social scientist sciences. It's basically um, an impact factor. The impact factor is they count how many times an article that is published in a journal, is quoted, is cited in other journals uh, two years after it's, pu it's published and five years after it's published. Uh, this, of course, is more for the hard sciences, but in the humanities and social sciences, people are still quoting Plato and you know, things that were published 2,000 years ago. But it's coming in because it's one of the ways through the index was really developed for librarians, but now it's coming. It's one of the ways through which journals are now being judged. Um, incredibly so, but it's true. Public citations in books do not count. Citations in journals that are not registered with this association that does the counting are not counted. That hits us really hard because being a humanities, social science, or soft social science journal, 
most of our citations appear in books constantly, and most of our, our appear in journals that are in Spanish, or journals that are not within this clique of journals that are accepted into these associations. Um, we just spent um, a month looking through Google Scholar and through all sources of our citations, and are happy to say, I'm very happy to say, that within the last 10 years, our articles we found that were cited over 1,500 times, and that's an incredible number, and that while we don't have a citation index of one, which means that for each article you publish, they cite you one in the last two years or five years, we have a citation of half of that, 0.5, and there are very prestigious journals that don't have that. So, so our goal now is to increase those citations. I have to, um, I should end now, but I want to thank you all, as I said three times, gracias, muchas gracias, muchísimas gracias for being here and for this honor. I want to thank my colleagues in the department, President Fernandez, the people at Centro, uh, and the people that I work with at Centro who have welcomed me, even though I come from a different institution, no, and they have welcomed me with open arms and have always helped me in my task. So thank you very much. Good afternoon. What I'm going to do here today is build on Dr. Thomas's remarks, and interestingly, President Fernandez's remarks, as well as uh, the remarks of my colleague, Javier. I want to thank Andy Torres for his generosity of spirit and for his in enthusiastic inv invitation that allowed me to participate in this dialogue today. And I also want to thank two of my colleagues, Merida Rua, and Ricky Rodriguez for their comments, critique, and suggestions um, in today's uh, presentation. Reflections on Puerto Rican migration, settlement, and legacy, embraces and encounters. In solidarity with Yadira, Fatima, and Jennifer. A couple of weeks ago, following a conference at Rutgers University and Española, I sat with a few friends and colleagues over dinner. Our conversations took many circuitous routes as we pondered the state of Caribbean studies, the discipline of anthropology, as well as the issues of voice, the act of writing, the silences embedded in the archive, as well as power. Jadira turned to me at one point and asked, if I could ever imagine being anything other than an anthropologist or an academic. Nervous laughter erupted, and Fatima said, you don't really have to answer that. And I smiled, and I thought to myself, indeed I do. In response, the storyteller emerged, the voice that provides what Clifford Geertz once called thick description. Their questions, comments, elicited other stories of celebration, of pain past and present, that mark our journey as women, as scholars in and of the diaspora. In the final analysis, I said no. The anthropological craft, not the discipline itself, informs who I've become. So as you'll note, this is part memoir, part storytelling, and part commentary. In the spirit of today's celebration, I would argue that Javier, who I incidentally met in a meeting of the American Anthropological Association years ago, has the kind of vision and respect for a craft that informs who he is and what the Centro Journal has become under his leadership, with the support of a dedicated staff that is engaged in what Virginia Dominguez calls for a politics of love and rescue. Part one, migration and settlement. The milieu that informs my understanding of Puerto Rico, of my heritage, was experienced and lived at the kitchen table, at extended family gatherings via the remembrances of my elders, the sound of music from the long plain, and daily enactments of Puerto Ricanidad, conscious and unconscious, that fed and continue to feed my soul. Culture, I was taught early on, is embodied, 
learned, practiced, and transformed in the act of living. I am not a New Yorker. I have never lived in a stateside Puerto Rican neighborhood, and I never attended a school with a cohort, so to speak, of Puerto Rican students or teachers. As a child, there were no books in my home or at school that contextualized my experiences, or for that matter, the experiences of other Puerto Ricans. It wasn't that we didn't have a desire for those books. They were simply not available to us, and we could not afford them. Instead, there were kitchen table storytellers, Puerto Rican men and women, que se dieron a respetar in spite of their modest means and limited formal education. They were living archives. They were, and not only representatives of the books that were written and have yet to be written, they were living books in and of themselves, who turned the pages at their will, imparting knowledge while they sipped una tacita de café con leche. I did, however, read Gwendolyn Brooks, Maya Angelou, Amiri Bacara, among others. My school teacher gave me those precious gifts. You see, I came of age as a young reader at the height of the Black Power Movement in Newark, New Jersey. Context matters. As a young college student in upstate New York, Puerto Rican, uh, fellow Puerto Rican students, excuse me, outright rejected my cultural claim because they could not um, imagine Puerto Ricanidad uh, rooted in something other than their experiences as urbanites and as New Yorkans. In their view, I was not Puerto Rican enough. In spite of this, outside of the contours of uh, Puerto Rican student groups, I did develop relationships and shared understandings via other affinities, including our shared experiences in the classroom. But I understood that claims to authenticity marked and marginalized us, rendering it more difficult to form alliances that acknowledged different forms of knowing. One afternoon in May, as we ran toward the commencement tents, seeking shelter from the rain, Yolanda Rivera, a fellow Puerto Rican from my Spanish class and I, congratulated one another. We had just graduated. We were two among the five Puerto Ricans to graduate that year. The others became casualties of the academy. Raised in the Bronx, she called upon her parents to introduce them to my mother. And before she spoke, her father and my mother smiled, uttered each other's name, and embraced. Yolanda and I were dumbfounded. They were, as it turns out, childhood schoolmates in Naguabo, Puerto Rico. And by circuitous routes, both of their daughters found themselves in upstate New York among the handful of Puerto Rican graduates at Colgate University. A consciousness of our shared history embedded in our parents' embrace and a mutual respect for the interlocking routes of sameness and difference that marked our Puerto Ricanidad emerged, and in that split second, the misconceptions that fixed our respective identities came tumbling down. Shortly thereafter, I became an Aspira counselor, and I befriended a fellow dropout prevention counselor, an emergent poet, the renowned Nancy Mercado, who recently published a special issue of Fatitude, What's in a Nombre, Writing Latina Identity in America. Her work also forms part of the Centro Journal. It was at the height of the Marielito boat lift, and we found ourselves counseling both Puerto Rican and Cuban students in New Jersey about the prospects and possibilities of obtaining an advanced education in the face of massive dropouts among the youth in New Jersey's public high schools. Our mutual respect for sameness, difference, embodied knowledge, and a politics of love informed our collective action. One evening, Nancy invited me to an opening at El Museo del Barrio, and I don't recall anything at all, and I'm not kidding, anything at all, about the exhibit. Memory is a funny thing. 
However, what is etched in memory is the subway and the encounter that got me there in the presence of a Puerto Rican giant. En route, we picked up a friend Nancy wanted me to meet. It was the late Pedro Pietri. He was curious, and I even more. We talked over the clatter of the subway trains, and he asked lots of questions. My love for the word, I suspect, was evident. I do recall that he respected the funds of knowledge that informed my then very uneasy voice. My poetic frames of reference were Allen Ginsberg, Theodore Redke, Amidi Baraka, Lydia Cabrera, Aimé Césaire, and I was in new terrain, and he knew that. Nonetheless, the subway ride was marked with a series of ruminations about class, color, blackness, and the absence of color, topics I came to understand and appreciate more fully as I learned more about the poet, the man, the persona, and the Puerto Ricanidad that he embodied so eloquently and expressed in Puerto Rican obituary, among other works I would later read. The Centro Journal then provided a fertile terrain to contextualize those stories, and it continually prompts me to consider the archive. Um, in the interest of time, I was going to elaborate on a couple of examples, and perhaps I will leave them um, for the question and answer. And I'll move to part two. Como solía decir mi madre, in those unmarked and marked cultural spaces of Puerto, Puerto Ricanidad and intimacies between speakers, hay tela que cortar. The Central Journal allows us to situate ourselves in the past and the unfolding histories of the present. Why the stories? It's my legacy. It's our legacy as children of migrants and settlers. Who gets to tell their story? Who gets to have their say, a como de lugar? And how are those histories affirmed or reaffirmed in an archive in a way that speaks to our multiple identities and to the process of becoming, and I want to underscore the process of becoming, that considers larger sociocultural processes, cartographies, and ways of being and knowing. How can and do we impart that knowledge across the arts, humanities, and the sciences to open up the terrain to reveal the contours of Puerto Rican thought and practice? The teaching of Puerto Rican culture is surely needed. Texts abound that have helped many of us make sense of the memories we embody collectively and as individuals. Nevertheless, given that foundation, we still have to be willing to disrupt overarching narratives of migration and settlement that still fail to address the varied trajectories and hidden and yet embodied in the aforementioned embraces and encounters. These, I think, are the challenges and the possibilities found in the pages of the Central Journal and in conversations that continue to take place at the table in communion with others. And for this, Javier, I thank you. Oh, all right. <laughs> thank you. Uh, before I say a few words, uh, let me uh, join previous speakers in extending my congratulations to Javier. I think the work that Javier has done in the Centro Journal has been extraordinary. Uh, not only the quantity of the work, but the quality of the Centro Journal, I think, deserves uh, to be recognized. And this, uh, I think, is the work of, of Javier. Like uh, Lauren and Dr. Fernandez mentioned earlier, in a time where the work and the research done by Puerto Rican Latino scholars is being questioned. The role that the Centro Journal has, been, uh, has played in the field of Puerto Rican studies needs to be recognized. So my congratulations to my dear friend Javier. 
And uh, let's hope that in, what, 15 years, we can celebrate the 25th, <laughs> no? <laughs> anyway, uh, I don't have a written presentation. Andy told me this was to be kind of an informal thing, so I took his advice. Now, uh, I want to say a few words with regards to some conversations that I have had with Javier regarding the issue of the topic of this panel, Puerto Rican migration. Uh, my conversations with Javier uh, go way back uh, to those infamous talks we had, to, to, to the, I'm sorry, to the talks we have in the infamous library of the graduate school down in the basement. Uh, when we were graduate students, way, way back. So I guess you don't want to talk about that, so I'll move to the present. Uh, <laughs> I was very young. Yes, we were. Anyway, uh, in more recent conversations with Javier, uh, I had the pleasure and the benefit of talking to Javier regarding one issue that I am working on, and that is uh, Puerto Rican migration, particularly uh, migration policy. Uh, and I remember uh, particularly a conversation, or many conversations, regarding the nature of Puerto Rican migration. Basically, the issue if this is an internal migration or if it's a transnational migration. Uh, basically, because in the last, what, 10, 15 years, the, uh, a, a dominating uh, trend in the study of international migration is that dealing with transnational migrations. And of course, some well-known uh, Puerto Rican scholars particularly anthropologist Jorge Luani, has argued that Puerto Rican migration has to be understood as a transnational migration. I myself engaged in the study of Puerto Rican uh, migration policy, had no problem with that. I mean, when you read the literature on political transnationalism, one of the issues that comes across clearly is, as a well-known scholar on political transnationalism stated, migration policy is a clear sign of political transnationalism. So I say, hey, you know, <laughs> this is easy. If the Puerto Rican government has a migration policy, that means that, by definition, Puerto Rican migration has to be understood as a transnational migration. Now, Javier, at least at the time we talk about this, wasn't convinced about this argument. And he kept pointing to me, well, you know, how can Puerto Ricans be transnational migrants if they are US citizens? How can Puerto Rico be a transnational space if Puerto Rico is a colony of the United States. I mean, by definition, transnationalism involves the movement of people from one nation state to the other. The famous phrase, you know, is the crossing of national borders. And of course, Puerto Ricans do not cross national borders in that sense. Now, can they be? another internal migration, like many other, like some other scholars, like Carlos here argues, uh, I'm not yet convinced. Now, as a consequence of my conversations with Javier, I began to think about this issue. Well, perhaps Puerto Rican migration is not really transnational, but why does it resemble a transnational migration. After reviewing the literature on political transnationalism, I came out with eight or nine elements that characterize political transnationalism. 
And the Puerto Rican experience applied to all except one. That dealing with citizenship, be it the granting of US citizenship or the granting of dual citizenship or nationality by the home state. In all the other elements, the Puerto Rican experience could be coupled to that of political transnationalism. So I began to think, you know, why is this? Now I had to redefine my perspective from arguing that it is a transnational migration to trying to answer why, if it's not a transnational migration, does it resemble one? By the way, I'm still working on that. Uh, but I think it's, it's a worthwhile uh, project. Uh, in trying to answer that, of course, in dealing with my research topic, which is migration policy, I have to face a question, well, why is there a migration policy by the Puerto Rican government if Puerto Rico is a colonial state? In that sense, I keep arguing with Carlos, for example, Puerto Rico does not resemble any internal migration. I mean, the state of Oklahoma was not managing migration of the Okies to California. I still haven't seen uh, I still haven't seen one example of states in Alabama or Mississippi managing the migration of African Americans to the east and the north. So in that sense, although we might say, you know, well, perhaps Puerto Rico is not a case of transnationalism, well, there are some things that do really resemble a transnational experience. Now. As a consequence of this, I had to go back to an issue that although I am by training a political scientist, I really never had the guts to deal with, and that is the whole legal thing about citizenship, particularly the insular cases. And uh, as a consequence of rethinking all this, I had to deal with citizenship but also, and this came as a very important surprise to me, migration is really linked to citizenship. And not only the most obvious thing that, well, Puerto Rican migration really increased after 1917, but even going way back to the construction of a colonial state by the United States. Because citizenship was an important issue there. Well, basically, the negation of citizenship. That is, Puerto Ricans were defined as citizens of Puerto Rico under the Foraker Act of 1900. And they were US nationals until 1917. Now, when you scratch that surface, and really, I mean scratch, I had to go into the hearings of several of these so-called insular cases, Downs versus Bidwell, Gonzalez versus Williams, and there it was, the issue of citizenship. And linked to that was the issue of migration. Uh, by the way, as a result of that, coming back again to Javier, I, uh, I, uh, I just uh, submitted to Central Journal a, uh, the manuscript of an article dealing precisely with the issue of migration. And I have to thank Javier for, very, uh, for being very kind and say, well, I think it needs <coughs> a bit of revision. He's <laughs> 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 always a gentleman. Uh, and so I did. Uh, and now I think it's under, it's under review. Uh, but that, that piece of writing, I think I owe uh, to Javier. And I think Javier has been an inspiration, not only as a friend and as a colleague, but he has been an inspiration as the editor of the Centro Journal, which I think is, without any doubt, the foremost uh, 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 outlet for research on Puerto Ricans.
in the United States or in Puerto Rico. And again, my congratulations to my friend and dear colleague Javier. And que estés ahí por muchos años. Thank you. Okay, so we do have a few minutes uh, to take some questions, comments. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Vargas Ramos was certainly thrown something to <laughs> work with if he so chooses to react, uh, but uh, anyone. <laughs> and would you please, uh, sure. Uh, All right, well, I wasn't expecting that. But <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Carlos Vargas Ramos, a research associate at the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, and he has taught at many uh, CUNY campuses as well. As well. Thank you, Andy. Uh, and again, I, I'd like to take this opportunity to really congratulate wholeheartedly Javier Todi for his tremendous uh, labor uh, at the helm of the Center Journal, the Journal of the Center for Puerto Rican Studies. He has done a titanic uh, uh, work uh, in bringing the quality of this uh, journal to where it is today. Uh, the question that I actually had was not so much uh, in response to my being real into the conversation, but perhaps to Javier and to my fellow colleagues, uh, Arlena and uh, Edgardo, on what are the challenges that we are facing uh, uh, in the Central Journal as an ethnic studies journal? Um, that you foresee, and how can we, the larger Puerto Rican studies uh, community, and we Puerto Rican scholars, can assist in meeting these challenges? But I will, however, answer uh, <laughs> perhaps uh, tangentially to Edgardo, and it's not that I don't say uh, that Puerto Ricans are engaged in an internal migration. I just negate that uh, Puerto Rican migration is a transnational migration. Uh, we can just leave it at the fact that it is a colonial migration, a territorial migration, and we can discuss the nuances in some of the setting, and we will in Lhasa pretty soon. We will. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't want to uh, make this too imposing. You don't have to come up to the podium. You can just come to the side if you have any uh, other comment or question, point that you'd like to add to the discussion. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for your remarks. Um, it's really wonderful to hear. Uh, if there is going to be a discussion of the transnational um, versus <laughs> um, more local internal configuration, I would just like to offer um, perhaps considerations of words, uh, frameworks, such as translocal, perhaps. Um, sort of the more, I guess, cosmopolitan literature that perhaps could offer um, some sort of middle ground um, that servia kind of uh, linkages. So I just wanted to add that, if, if that conversation were to, to come up. So thank you. Uh, Patti is a doctoral student, UCLA, doing research on Puerto Rican uh, community-based organizations. Uh, and we welcome her uh, words as well as encourage her and support her uh, to continue with her project. Okay, so I think we're good for now. Uh, thank you again uh, all for coming. Uh, a reminder about the Salud Conference. This is May 11th here on campus as well. Uh, we have informational uh, leaflets uh, if you're interested in more information and we will continue to keep you update on that uh, one last thank you and appreciation to professor javier totti <laughs>